The wreck of the 1738 Gothenburg was recovered in 1986. In 2003, a replica of the ship was launched, and in 20 months between 2005 and 2007, she travelled her original route to China and back home, visiting places like Cadiz, Spain, Cape Town, South Africa, and Canton, China. If you're into the age of sail, you have likely heard of this journey and seen videos of the replica and her crew. But in this video, I want to explain the history behind this ship and the intrigues which eventually led to her ultimate disaster. The Age of Sail was a period of international commerce. The most profitable trade was between Asia and Europe, and these routes were monopolized by national trading companies. Most famous were the Dutch VOC and the British EIC, known for their appearance in Pirates of the Caribbean, and the series Taboo. Some lesser known companies were the Danish East India and the unfortunate Ostender Company. The Ostender Company operated out of Flanders, which was ruled by Austria in the mid 1700s. Austria's rivals were not so happy about their efforts, and the company had to surrender its privileges and disband. Many foreigners were involved in the company, such as the Scotsman Colin Campbell. Campbell now found himself without a job moved to Sweden and helped establish the Swedish East India Company. Based in the city of Gothenburg, located on the west coast of Sweden, the purpose of the company was to send large cargo ships for trade with China. Sweden, like all of Europe, was infatuated with Chinese products and culture. Protestant scientists were fascinated by Chinese botany and Confucian philosophy. The aristocracy wanted tea, silk, lacquerware and porcelain. You could even order porcelain from China, which had your name written on it. Simply put, there was a lot of money to be made. The ship Gothenburg was one of these cargo vessels, called East Indiamen. Built at the Terranova shipyard in Stockholm, the Gothenburg was larger than the ships from other countries. She had a length of 58 meters, three decks, and weighed 132 modern tons. Oak was the primary building material, but deal was sometimes utilized. She was full rigged, meaning that the ship had three masts, primarily carrying square-shaped sails. We don't know her maximum speed under full sail. The hull of the East Indiaman had a rounded shape, which allowed for more cargo capacity, but hindered her sailing capabilities. Similar ships such as the Kalmar could reach a maximum speed of 9 knots, whereas the ship Finland could only reach 6. Her armament consisted of between 20 to 30 guns, though these were primarily meant for firing salutes. The Gothenburg's primary defense was psychological. Pirates, usually a threat around Madagascar, could be scared off by hoisting the forked flag of the Swedish navy. The Swedish East Indiamen were built much the same as warships. Sometimes they were even old frigates and navy vessels repurposed for trading. Thus, by hoisting this flag, they were indistinguishable from a man of war at a distance. The crew counted around 140 men. The mortality rate sat around 12% and 30 men died during her third voyage, which this video concerns. The seas was the primary cause. Ranking doesn't seem to have affected its survival rate. Before the ship could reach Cadiz, the ship's surgeon died from a fever. Five sailors would jump ship during the voyage, and all these casualties would have to be replaced. Organization aboard was managed by the ship's captain, of course, and the supercargo. The latter were company representatives that handled the business end of things but their authority was technically all-encompassing. The captain had more experience in handling the ship and crew, but was obliged to follow the supercargo. Aside from those, there were plenty of minor officers, even a ship's priest. The higher-ups had their own cook, and would enjoy finer meals including delicacies such as wine, olives, turkey and spinach. Most men were ordinary mate lots. They slept and ate on the gun deck and kept their belongings in triangular-looking sea chests. One journal described their meals as rather one-dimensional. It was either salt meat, pork or fish, eaten with peas, grains, butter and bread. The peas and grains were prepared into a stew or porridge, and the bread came in the form of rock-hard biscuit. When the ship entered warmer latitudes, the diet was improved with local fruits and veggies, a necessary relief against the scurvy. Crewmen in the cold weather could look forward to a cup of hot punch, strong spirits mixed with lemon juice. There were likewise live animals kept aboard as fresh provisions. These included three oxen, twenty swine, ten pigs, ten cows, ten goats, nine sheep, four hundred chicken, and five ducks. 
Everyone was paid a set wage, in addition to profits made from selling the cargo. However, every individual was allowed to purchase as many Chinese items as they could carry back aboard. Known as the Pacotil, it could then be sold for a profit back home. The Gothenburg departed Sweden on the 14th of March, 1743. The ship had to reach Indonesia by summer in order to exploit the monsoon season for wind. Setting sail in winter meant that the ship had to endure ice and a terrible cold. To make it worse, the Gothenburg sailed north of Scotland. The waves were high, the wind and cold bit you to the bone. Both officers and crewmen were dressed in thick fur coats. They could have sailed through the English Channel. This route was surely shorter, but the winds were calmer in the season, making this route longer. And as aforementioned, time was of the essence. Several casualties were sustained before the ship arrived in Cadiz, Spain. The rapid shift in temperatures often led to health issues. The sailors would shave their heads for cooling. But warmer weather meant fresh provisions. A bricklayer was even brought aboard to build an oven. Most importantly, Swedish produce was exchanged for Spanish silver. This was because the Chinese refused to trade with anything other than silver coins. They had no need for barbarian European products. Next, the ship sailed for the canneries. Owing to poor quality sea charts and instruments, ships of this time were reliant on landmarks for navigation. Usually, this was different islands. Having experienced and well-traveled officers was a lifesaver, and on the early voyages, it was common to find French, English and Dutchmen aboard the Swedish ships. When the ship crossed the equator, new sailors were baptized in a sort of pagan ceremony, where the crew dressed up as Neptune and washed the new bloods with buckets of water. Money was collected for charity and for a big welcoming party when they were back home. Some of the ships crossed the Atlantic over to Brazil, owing to the winds, whilst others sailed straight for South Africa. They did not stop in Cape Town, but immediately they crossed the Cape of Good Hope. This crossing is infamous for its strong winds and horrible storms, which gave birth to the legend of the Flying Dutchman. Significant measures had to be taken to prepare the ships, such as lashing down the guns and replacing the sails with stronger variants. The ship sailed straight to the Indian Ocean. They stopped in Java, and due to poor winds, they would often come to a standstill at Sunda. The native Javanese would come out to them in little boats, selling them fresh fruits and animals. From Java, the voyage was straight to China. Canton was a Chinese city that traded with Europeans, though it was located too far inland for the East Indiamen to reach. They had to anchor at the island of Wampoa, two miles from the city, and traveled there by the Pearl River. The ship was met by a customs official and his entourage, called Hoppo by the Swedish. The officers met with the official, exchanging gifts and pleasantries in a ceremonial meeting. Afterwards, they traveled together to the city. Europeans were only allowed at their so-called factories. These establishments served as storehouses, living quarters, and offices for the company officials. It was here that they conducted business. The crew were not allowed to enter the city. They had to stay aboard for many grueling weeks. Temperatures were high, and it was not uncommon for gambling, fist fights, and knife fights to break out. Most of their time was spent repairing and maintaining the ship. After four long months, business was concluded. The cargo had been stowed aboard, and the ship departed for its long journey back home. The voyage back home could take as few as six months. On the Gothenburg's third and final voyage, it took two and a half years. No journals have been preserved from this voyage, so we are not sure what happened along the way. Additional crewmen were picked up, and we can presume that they hunted turtles for provisions. Food usually became an issue on the way back, as the officers wished to save time, money, and cargo space. When the Gothenburg finally arrived in, well, the city of Gothenburg, a local pilot was brought aboard to guide her to the port. The winds were calm, but the pilot managed to run the ship aground on a hidden rock. The ship took on water at a rapid pace, but the crew were able to escape with some of the cargo. From the safety of the shoreline, people watched as the Gothenburg sank. Multiple versions of the event were provided by crewmen, officers, and other witnesses. The pilot was universally blamed for the wrecking and put under arrest in the local fort. Every pilot in the region knew about the rock and the dangers it posed, so it seems baffling as to why the pilot steered the ship right into it. 
he wasn't drunk or inexperienced. Statements generally called him careless, and it might have been so. A later theory believes that the Gothenburg was the victim of a conspiracy, an insurance scam from the supercargos and owners of the ship. The pilot would have been bribed to run the ship aground, and we know that he was later released. He had five children and a wife, and would have needed money. But his life situation never seemed to have significantly improved, so it is unlikely that he took a bribe large enough to warrant his arrest and potential imprisonment. Whether he took a bribe or not, he was let go shortly after the incident, and even returned to his old trade as a pilot. He remarried after the death of his wife, and passed away at the ripe old age of 70. Pretty impressive in the 18th century. In the Book of Deaths, he was called the Old Pilot. It is true that the ship and her cargo was insured. It is likewise true that the ship's first supercargo and leader of the expedition, August Tabitol, abandoned company service after the incident. It's a bit suspicious, but that's about the last of the evidence for the insurance theory. It isn't surprising that Tabitol would have been fired or willingly left the company after such a disaster. He had partaken in two previous successful voyages, and likely had a fortune he could live out his days on. A letter from Colin Campbell revealed suspicions towards Tabitol. It is speculated that the illicit activities were conducted on way back home. This idea is countered by the fact that all transactions were written down in a well-kept logbook. Pretty much all of the money was used in Canton. This amount of money spent corresponds to the rescued items that were auctioned after the disaster, as well as archaeological findings from the shipwreck. We don't know what caused the Gothenburg's ultimate demise. It is very likely that it was a mere accident. Efforts were made from the local diver society to recover some of the cargo and shipwreck. But it wasn't until 1986 that the ship was truly recovered. And here we are today. The ship is reborn in her replica, sailing the seven seas, much like her unfortunate original. There is much more untold history concerning the Swedish East India and the European trade with China. Apart from the stuff you hear all the time about the 19th century and the opium wars and stuff. I'm more so interested in the stuff you don't hear about that often, like the stuff that happened in the 18th century and the 17th. If you wish to learn more about one of the trading companies in particular, please tell me in the comments. I also wish to extend thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon, Bradley Rotter and Nicholas Brunder. If you wish to support me monetarily, please check out the links to Patreon and PayPal in the video description.